Given the empirical relationship between the activity coefficient and the ionic strength, as approximated by the Davies equation, adding ions to the solution will at first have a beneficial effect and then a negative effect on the solubility of the ions in solution. This arises from the fact that at low ionic concentrations, ions of opposite charge will associate with one another and not each other, which lowers the potential energy of the system, leading to a higher affinity for the solution to dissolve a higher concentration of ions. However, as more ions are introduced, like charges will interact with each other more strongly, raising the potential energy of the system and reduce the affinity for the solution to dissolve ions. Therefore, the ionic strength of a solution can directly affect the solubility of a substance. This is called salting in and salting out. We're now going to do an example which illustrates this phenomena of salting in and salting out, where we're going to use a sparingly soluble compound, in this case magnesium fluoride, which is going to dissolve into water to form magnesium ions and fluoride ions with an equilibrium constant of 6.4 times 10 to the minus 9, and we're going to examine three different cases for this. The first case, which is what we're going to look at in number one, is if we were to just throw in magnesium fluoride salt into water, what is the equilibrium concentration of the ions. So what is essentially, what would we expect in terms of just the solubility of these ions just by themselves in the solution? In the second question, what we're going to do is we're going to then, at equilibrium, we're going to add in 0.01 molar of potassium nitrite salt, which is a very soluble salt, so we're going to assume that it dissociates completely. And we're going to see what happens with the concentration of the dissolved magnesium fluoride ions. And the upshot to this is that we expect that because this is a small concentration, that we're going to increase the concentration of these ions, and this is salting in. And then finally, in this final question, question three, we're going to add in a lot of this KNO3 salt. And what we're going to do is calculate now the new concentration of dissolved ions. And what we'll see is that as we greatly increase the concentration of this salt, we're going to decrease then the, the solubility of the magnesium fluoride and that this is then going to be called salting out. So starting with question one, since we're dealing with an equilibrium expression, we're simply going to start by writing our ice table. We have our MgF2, which is a solid, plus H2O, which is a liquid, and that's going to be in some equilibrium with Mg2+, plus, plus 2F-, minus. and if I write my ice table, ICE, well, because we've got a solid and we've got a liquid, then those two things don't matter. And at the starting point, we have 0, 0, plus x, plus 2x. And so then at equilibrium, we're going to have x and 2x as our equilibrium concentrations of our two ions. And then from there, we just start by writing our equilibrium expression, Ksp. That's going to be equal to the activity of magnesium 2 plus times the activity of fluorine minus raised to the power of 2. And if we substitute in for these activities, then what we end up with is Ksp is equal to gamma plus minus times the molality of magnesium 2 plus divided by the standard molality times gamma plus minus times the molality of the fluoride ion divided by the standard molality all squared. So we're now in a bit of a chicken and an egg problem because to calculate these equilibrium concentrations, we need to know what these gammas are. We need to know what these average activity coefficients are. But to calculate these average activity coefficients, we need to know the ionic strength, which to know the ionic strength, which I'm writing down the expression over here, which is equal to 1 half times the sum over all the ions, times which is the charge of all the ions squared times the concentration of all the ions divided by the standard concentration. Well, we need to know what the concentration of ions in solution before we can calculate the gamma plus minus, the average activity coefficient. So the solution to this problem is that we will take an iterative approach where for this first round, before we actually solve for the equilibrium concentration, taking it into account the ionic strength, we will just assume that the ions are not important, at least for this first time through. And this is so that we can get a first estimate as to the, the, the concentration of ions in solution, so that then we can then calculate an ionic strength to then calculate a new average activity coefficient to then find out what is actually the concentration of ions in solution. And so that's the strategy that we're going to follow right now. And so if I was to write out that strategy that what we're going to do, we're going to first assume that gamma plus minus is equal to 1, 
meaning the ions have no effect. We're going to calculate the concentration of the ions. Based on this, we can actually then calculate an ionic strength. From that, we can then calculate what is actually the gamma plus minus, or at least a better estimate of the gamma plus minus. And then we're going to then find out what is the concentration of ions taking into account this new gamma plus minus. Let's now put this plan into action. And so what that means then is I'm going to set these average activity coefficients to be equal to 1. And then if I start substituting in numbers, I can get 6.4 times 10 to the minus 9. The concentration of the magnesium ions, well, I have that over here from x, so that's going to be equal to x. I have the concentration of fluoride ions, which is just going to be 2x, so I have 2x all squared. And then I know that these standard mole concentrations, they're just equal to 1 mole per kilogram, so I can just set those to 1. This then makes a fairly straightforward um, solution to find what x is. And so if I take the 4 and divide both sides by 4, I'm going to get 6.4 times 10 to the minus 9 divided by 4 is equal to x cubed. And I'm just going to take the cube root of both sides. And so what I'm going to get when I solve for x is going to be equal to 1.17 times 10 to the minus 3. And what that means then is that my concentration of my magnesium ions is going to be equal to 1.17 times 10 to the minus 3. And my concentration of fluoride ions is going to be equal to 2.34 times 10 to the minus 3 because it's equal to 2 times x. So 2 times 1.17 times 10 to the minus 3 is equal to 2.34 times 10 to the minus 3. So that's the first two steps of this plan. The next step is to calculate the ionic strength. And so now I actually have a concentration of, at least a first iterative uh, knowledge of the concentration of ions in solution. So now I can calculate I. So in this case, I'm going to have I is equal to 1 half, and this is the sum of over all these terms. So the first term is going to be 2 squared, since I'm talking about the magnesium. And the concentration of the magnesium is 1.17 times 10 to the minus 3. And that's going to be divided by 1, since that's the standard molal concentration. And to that, I'm going to add minus 1, because now I'm talking about the fluorine. So minus 1 squared times 2.34 times 10 to the minus 3. And that's going to be divided by 1 as well. My ionic strength then is equal to 1 half times 4.68 times 10 to the minus 3 plus 2.34 times 10 to the minus 3, which means that my ionic strength is going to be equal to 3.51 times 10 to the minus 3. And so if we're trying to decide now if we're going to use the Debye uh, limiting law, if we're going to use the Davies equation, that test that we were going to use um, or the choice we make is if we say if the square root of i is greater than or less than 0.2 and in this case the square root of 3.51 times 10 to the minus 3 is less than 0.2 and so then we'll use the limited law to calculate our average activity coefficient and that's what is our next step on this. So we've just done number 3 here, we've calculated the ionic strength and so our next thing now is to do the average activity coefficient so to calculate that, we use the Debye-Huckel limiting law, which as we saw before, it's the logarithm of the average activity coefficient being equal to negative 0 0.509 times the absolute value of z plus times z minus, which is the charge on the positive and negative ion, times the square root of i. The log of the average activity coefficient is equal to negative 0 0.509 times 2 times minus 1 absolute value, and that's times the square root of 3.51 times 10 to the minus 3, which was the ionic strength that we just calculated a second ago. We have the log of the average activity coefficient then is equal to negative 6.03 times 10 to the minus 2, which then means that our average activity coefficient is equal to 0.87. And so this was now step four that's completed, where we've now calculated the average activity coefficient given that we have some concentration of ions in solution. 
So our last thing now is then to calculate what is the concentration of ions in our solution, given that now we are actually quantifying the effect of the ions on the solution. And so to do that, then we just go back to our equilibrium expression. So we have Kx, Ksp is equal to the activity of the magnesium ions times the activity of the fluoride ions squared. I'm going to do the exact same substitution. I have Ksp is equal to gamma plus minus times the molality of the magnesium ions divided by the standard molality. And that's going to be times the average activity coefficient times the molality of the fluoride ions divided by the standard molality. And that's raised to the power of 2. And so in this case now, instead of setting my average activity coefficient to 1, which assumes that the ions have no effect, we know that the ions do have an effect. We are dealing with a real solution, and we've actually now calculated an average activity coefficient for this system. And so that means that I'm going to keep my gamma plus minuses. What I will do is I can immediately cross off these standard molal concentrations, because they're both just 1. And so if I start to substitute in numbers, I'm going to get 6.4 times 10 to the minus 9, and that's going to be equal to 0 0.87 cubed. And where I get that from is I get 1 from the activity of magnesium, and I get 2 from the activity of fluoride because of the fact that it's squared. And then I get times x, which is from the concentration of magnesium, and then I have 2x all squared, which is with the concentration of the fluoride ion. And so then in this case I then rearrange 6.4 times 10 to the minus 9 divided by 4 times 0 0.87 cubed and that's going to be equal to x cubed and so I'm going to just take the cubed root of both these numbers and what that leaves me with is an x that's equal to 1.34 times 10 to the minus 3. And so what we can see here is that the difference between this x, this 1.34 times 10 to the minus 3, and the x that we calculated before, which was this 1.17 times 10 to the minus 3, that illustrates to us that there really is a difference when we take into account the fact that the solution is real. That the average activity coefficient does mean that there is a different solubility that would be calculated from between the two cases of where we assume that the ions have no effect on each other to when the ions do have an effect on each other. And in the end what we have is a concentration then of the magnesium ions being equal to 1.34 times 10 to the minus 3 and the concentration of the fluoride ions is double that. So that means it is a concentration of 2.68 times 10 to the minus 3.